I, I, you know, I teach a lot of freshman uh, classes and a lot of intro to literature classes, and I, I love doing prosody with, with, with the kids and uh, recitation, memorization. I, I make them memorize poems and recite them to the class. Oh, it's painful. They, for them, for them, they just uh, because they, they they don't do it. If you do it in if you do it in your classes, then then they well, what happens is they come in. First of all, having to stand up in front of the class, you know, the, the presentation and, and everything is is painful for them. But as you work with them, you know, getting the the recitation out there, the memorization, you give them little, you know, don't no no, they, they forget. Don't help them. No one's, <laughs> and you, know, you might give them a little cue, and they go, boy, when, when, when they finish, you know, the smile, the accomplishment, they, they sit down, and they, they, they know that they've done something that is, that is worthwhile, and we do it throughout the semester. They get better at it, right? Memorization, memory's a muscle, right? You, you, you work it, you, you build it, and they like it. They definitely get past that. So and the prosody is, is, is fun and just, you know, scansion exercises and so on. So th thank you uh, on, on that, you know, the focus on, on words and pronunciation. And, and then the big picture, you know, just telling students there are these great works. You know, we're not going to read them in this class. They're ancient. They have survived the ages. And big things are happening, you know, the epic the epic hero, the epic events, and that I, I find that the, you know, the, the American 18-year-old, they, they want to feel like they are studying big things, right? They want the greatness. I'm going to college now, and they want to make contact with monuments, you know, powerful, big things. The world is bigger for them. They're away from their homes for, for, for the first time for most of them, and they want to feel the world is opening. For them, and and I think that that the scope of the epic, of the of the ancient, the long lasting, is uh, something that hits them on a deep level, and and it's hard for them. You guys prepare them for it. You know that that's what the great hearts, that's what the classical schools do. These are classics, and classics is a good word, uh, and and I think they're hungry for that, and a lot of students who don't have that end up envying those who, who did, because it's hard to do it on your own you know, when you're 30 years old. You know, who, reads, who, reads, who reads Paradiso you know, at, at age 30 on your own? That's going to be rare. Now, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about a, a, a slightly different thing regarding literary history, right? Literary history. And the big point that I'll make, I'm only going to talk about 10 minutes and leave time for questions. The big point is, that when you make your syllabi, even when you form units in the primary grades, that it's important when you teach literature that there is something of a story from work to work. Right? You, look, you look at the syllabus in, in your 12th grade English class, you see a plot somehow working, working through. Not, I mean, it could be something that, that, that may be more or less factitious. But to put the pieces into a structure of some kind for the students, one, it helps to remember, right? You position things within a narrative of some kind. People remember things better when the pieces are related in a causal or chronological or thematic fashion in, in some way. And the students will prefer that. And I'm going to give you an illustration that comes out of what Stanley Kurtz was talking about this morning. Uh, I don't know, many of you are too young to remember the Stanford episode, what happened in January 1987 at Stanford, which became, in fact, a national debate that went on for months. It, ha it was debated on the McNeil Air News Hour, which is what PBS was before, uh, uh, back, back then. Uh, on, on the network news shows, on debates around the country. Now, Stanley mentioned that Stanford had a Western Civ requirement through the 50s and the early 60s. And then he said that the, the professors just sort of lost confidence in it in the mid-60s. 
And that had to do with a lot with the Vietnam War uh, setting out. It had to do with the, the uh, prejudice against any prescriptive layout of the past, sort of a student rebelliousness, student revolt happening on college campuses, especially as those first boomers were hitting the, the campus. But so they got rid of the Western Civ requirement in the mid 60s. I actually went back a couple of years ago. I was at Stanford. I looked at old catalogs from the from the late 50s, early 60s, talking about the general ed requirements and the confidence with which they laid out Western civilization. It was such a positive thing presented to students. By the mid 60s, that had changed. They dropped it. And what they replaced it with was kind of a grab bag of different courses. And it wasn't working. And actually, there were complaints from graduate schools about Stanford undergraduates who'd gone there, who they said, they don't know, they don't know very much about you know, the sort of the past, the, the civilizational past. So Stanford actually reinstituted a course. And they called it Western culture. Western culture. And that was something of, the, of, of a similar thing, a little, a little more varied. And it was very popular through the 80s. And that course really was sort of Western Civ story. And that had a plot. It had a narrative, right? Jerusalem and Athens come together. They evolve through you know, Greece. Rome, and then migrates up into the medieval Europe. The church rises. The medieval period, Dante and Aquinas are the great representatives. It sort of migrates into the Renaissance, and then the Reformation, and then the Enlightenment, and then it travels to America. So there was, there was a story. I actually, I actually have a little, got a little paperback from the 50s called The Story of Civilization. Right? And it wanted, this, is, this is the story of the West running through these different centers, and you had your set pieces in there that everyone would teach. Well, that in the mid-'80s with the rise of, I'll just call it multiculturalism uh, for, for now, uh, questioning, this is too narrow. It's too, the word back then was Eurocentric. Eurocentrism was, was the problem. They didn't talk about it as too white. It wasn't, uh, there was kind of a dead white males thing, but it's more Eurocentrism, and we need more non-Western materials. So in January, uh, Jesse Jackson, who had come off a pretty prominent presidential campaign in 1984, the Rainbow Coalition, it was called, and he had some success in, he actually, you know, part of that damaging the, Republic, the, the Democrat ticket as insufficiently acknowledging, you know, the Mondale <coughs> ticket, insufficiently acknowledging the persons of color. And Jackson was gearing up for an 88 run. And so he came to Stanford because some of the students, mostly black students association leaders, said, this is too white a course here. And Jackson came, he saw this is a, you know, this is an issue that can become a campaign issue. He led 500 students in a march around campus, and the famous chant was, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's got to go. So the target was a general ed requirement in freshman year at Stanford. And the, a year later, it was kind of a local controversy, a year later, Richard Bernstein, the, the New York Times journalist uh, got wind that the faculty had decided to concede. OK, we're going to get rid of Western cultures, and we're going to create a more multicultural requirement. And Bernstein wrote an article in the New York Times chronicling this, and that's when it exploded into a national story. In fact, I, I went back to the New York Times issue uh, when Stanley's book came out and looked at the original newspaper story. That same day in the New York Times, Jesse Jackson's uh, plank speech, his stump speech, was published in the New York Times. Each prominent candidate had a stump speech published in the Times for a few weeks there. And, and that, was, that was Jesse Jackson's day. I thought that was, that was quite, quite a coincidence. But so they dropped the Western Cultures course, which stands right, was very popular. It was one of the most popular courses on campus. And alumni loved the course as well. 
So they, but, but they, they scrapped it and they replaced it with a multicultural course, a variety of courses which could satisfy the freshman requirement. They called it Culture, Ideas, Values, CIV. Okay. That was, that was the, the name for it. Culture, Ideas, Values, CIV. And they started teaching the course. And the course had to have, OK, you have to have some non-Western materials, representation by women authors, artists, thinkers of, of color, and so on. So a more diversity-based course. Six years later, so everyone remembers the Jesse Jackson March. That's, that's sort of one of the important moments in the culture wars as they hit American college campuses at that time. I'm going to wrap up real fast. Uh, and what happened was the Stanford then had this course. Six years later, Stanford did its curriculum review. And they surveyed the students. 72% said, bad course, the CIV course. Bad, we don't like it. Why didn't they like it? They asked them. Not because it's multicultural or diverse. No, they were fine with that. What they said was, there's no coherence. There's, we, you look at these courses, little of this, little of that, little of that. It's like the Chinese menu thing. I'll have this, and I'll have this, and I'll have this. And they said it didn't cohere into any sense, sensible, you know, broad, no big picture. You know, big B, big P, no big picture here. If you made a big picture of some kind out of these diverse materials, that would, have, that would have satisfied. But that was the problem. It wasn't coming together into a story. There's no story here. We just jump around this. Oh, well, I'll, I'll bring in some of this from this culture, some of this from this, some of this from this time. And so I think that is a lesson for us in the designing of our syllabi in the literature courses, there should be some literary history that some structure within which all, all these pieces hang, more or less hang together. You don't, you don't want to push it too far. But I mean, things like you know, the progressive uh, literary critic historians in the 1930s, they saw American literature as the story of progressive individual freedoms happening in America. And that you could fit all these works in there. Right? The Scarlet Letter is you know, Puritan repression against the individual female will. Right? The uh, uh, you know, Melville Benito, Frederick Douglass's narrative, uh, obviously Emerson's self-reliance, you know, Thoreau going into the woods. All these things could be developed into a story of expanding recognition of First Amendment for everyone, that kind of thing. So th there was a story there. It was a progressive, as a left-wing story to it. Just something, th think about that when you put your, your syllabus together. Give the students the, the, some bigger, bigger picture.